just be doing like we're doing today, not having people come in, but just an online service. And all, all of that is just in our efforts to be as safe as possible. And we know families will be gathering together, greeting together, and as our COVID cases are rising here in the Pennsylvania area, we just want to keep everyone as safe as possible. But we will be together soon. And again, as a reminder to our Banjo family, uh, you should have received an email with an opportunity for us to bless our Darby School, bless some of the students there with some Christmas presents. If you receive that and you want to be involved in that, please give, give our church office a call because the countdown is, 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 is upon us in getting those gifts uh, purchased and me being able to give them to the kids at the Darby School. So if you want to be a part of that opportunity of blessing those, those kids, give us a call. If you want to give just a donation to that, Again, give us a call. We'll be glad to have you be a part of that. 
This morning, if you have your Bibles, would you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Come on, folks, get those Bibles out. And let's get ready to get into the Word of God. So Acts chapter 22, and this morning, we're looking at verses 1 through 16. I'm excited today about this message that the Lord has placed on my heart to give to you. The title of my sermon this morning is Paul's Testimony. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are just an awesome God. And Lord God, I pray now that as I prepare to share this word, your word, Lord, I pray for your anointing, that you would anoint me here as I am preaching this word. But all those who are watching or listening, wherever they may be, here in the Pennsylvania area, here in our nation, and even out of our nation, and other countries throughout the world. Anoint them as well where they are. May they feel the power of your presence. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A slave trafficker was converted to Christianity from his wicked lifestyle. He eventually became a preacher and an abolitionist fighting against slavery. He's known for writing one of the most beloved hymns in the church, that hymn being amazing grace. His name, John Newton. A young shoe salesman was converted to Christianity when a, a Sunday school teacher from his uncle's church went to his shoe store and shared Christ with him. Uh, in spite of his lack of education, this young man went on to become a great preacher and a great evangelist. And it is estimated that millions of people came to Christ through his ministry. His name, D.L. Moody. One more. This brilliant scholar, scholar, this brilliant scholar denounced his atheism and became a follower of Jesus Christ. He then went on to become a great defender of the faith um, and a widely read Christian author producing works like the Screw Tape Letters and the Faith-Based Chronicles of Narnia that became a movie. His name, C.S. Lewis. The people in these stories were from different cities, different backgrounds, and different times in history. But they had two things in common. They became a Christian, and they had a testimony. And by testimony, I mean their faith story of how they became a Christian. My friends, I want you to know that if you are a Christian, you have a testimony, and your testimony is very powerful. Pastor Dudley Rutherford wrote this. He wrote, if you are a Christian, your testimony, the story of how God stepped in and changed you through his son, it is a direct reflection of the life-changing power of the gospel. It's one of the most effective tools in our evangelism toolbox. He went on to say, before you got saved, there was an old you who was caught up in sin and didn't know or have a relationship with the Lord. But now, because of Jesus Christ, you've been changed. And you can glorify God by magnifying his message by telling others about how he changed you. Let me emphasize the last part of his statement. He said, you and I, our testimony, our testimony can, can glorify God, meaning put God on display and magnify his message, make his message big and known to people. How? By telling others how God changed our life. My friends, today I hope to show you two things. Number one, that God can use your testimony to change people's lives. And secondly, I hope today to help you formulate your testimony by seeing how the Apostle Paul shared his. You know, we're going through the book of Acts and, you know, the Spirit of God led me to go through this book of Acts with you specifically this year of 2020, because you see, the book of Acts is about the power of the Holy Spirit 
working through the lives of ordinary people. And in this year of 2020, all of the challenges that we faced, I felt we needed to hear and be reminded about the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to remind you this morning, friends, that the Holy Spirit, he will empower you and infuse you with great power and enthusiasm as you share your testimony with people. The Holy Spirit will help you. Well, to set the scene of our text today, in Acts chapter 21, the Apostle Paul has traveled to Jerusalem. Now, while he was there, he was in the synagogues preaching the word of God, and some of the Jews heard him, and they, 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 they incited a riot. And a mob grabbed him, and this mob began to attack the, the Apostle Paul. And it was such a big disturbance that the Roman soldiers came to see what was going on. And just as God told Paul what, what was going to happen, it did happen. Paul was arrested. Well, as he's being taken into the uh, Roman barracks, he asked the soldiers if he could address the crowd. Paul then shares his testimony. Now listen, before we get into Paul's testimony and how we can you know, put our testimony together, I just want you to know, friends, there are many ways of sharing one's testimony. This is not the only way. This is just one of the ways we're talking about. There are many ways of doing that. But this morning, as we're looking at the Word of God, this portion of Scripture from Acts chapter 22, we're going to look at three aspects of Paul's testimony as we put our testimony together. All right. So the first part of telling our testimony is this. Telling people what life was like before we accepted Christ. Now, I, I, I highly encourage you, take some notes today. Write some of these things down that you have them. So the first uh, point of sharing our testimony is telling people what our life was like before we accepted Jesus. Look at verses 1 through 5. Acts 22, verses 1 through 5. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the crowd. He says, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictest man of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all you are this day. Verse 4, he writes, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. And as a high priest in the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I, I received letters to the brothers, and I, I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. What life was like before Paul accepted Jesus? Now, the crowd that Paul was addressing, they, they wanted him dead. They, they hated what he was saying, and they wanted Paul dead. But we see, friends, that Paul didn't speak to them uh, with a, a harsh tone in his voice. He spoke to them with love. He called them brothers and fathers. You see, by calling them brothers and fathers, Paul was attempting to identify with them as a member of the Jewish nation. And he was doing that for the purpose of trying to reach them. You see, he wanted to reach them. Why? Because he loved them. And he wanted them to become a Christian as he was. You see, friends, the end game of sharing our testimony, it is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ so they too will accept him as Savior. And that was, that was Paul's desire. He wanted these, these men who, who, who wanted him dead, but he loved them because they were, they were his Jewish brothers. They were his, 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 his fellow men, his fellow men of his nation. And he loved them, and he wanted them to be like Christ. Friends, we must understand that there may be people that we may meet that may not like us, but we still need to tell them about Jesus. There may be people that we may meet that may disagree with us, but we still have an obligation of telling them, telling them about the Lord. 
And the one, one of the best ways of doing that is sharing our faith story, sharing our testimony with them. Now for Paul, at this point in his journey, his Christian journey, it had been 25 years now since Paul had accepted Christ as his Savior. So he starts by telling this crowd what his life was like before accepting Jesus. And he says to them that he was, he was educated in the Jewish religion by some of its greatest Jewish teachers. He became a Pharisee, and uh, the Pharisees were a sect of Judaism that was totally dedicated to following Jewish laws in the most strictest ways, you see. This was Paul. He was a Pharisee. And because of his strict training in Judaism, Paul thought it was to the honor of God. He thought he was honoring God by persecuting the way. Now, the way was a, a term that they used for Christianity at that time. Those who were following Christ were, were, were called to be part of the way. Paul thought he was honoring God as he persecuted them. So he began to hunt down Christians, both men and women, and throw them in prison. Paul basically was saying, friends, that before he accepted Jesus, he was a religious terrorist who persecuted Christians even to their death. <clears throat> what would we say about ourselves? What kind of people were we before we accepted Jesus Christ? Okay, yes, understood. We weren't religious terrorists like Paul, but like Paul, we still were lost in our sins. You know, I'm doing a study with one of our church brothers, and a few weeks ago, we were talking about positive and negative character traits. And as I was looking at those negative character traits that was in our study, I began to see a description of the person I was before I accepted Jesus. My friends, if it wasn't for Jesus, who would we be? If it wasn't for Jesus, where would we be? Think about that for a second. Think about how your life could have turned out if it wasn't for Jesus. Think about the person you used to be. The direction of your life before you met Christ. Think about the journey you used to take, the path you used to be on before Jesus came. Oh, when I think about my life before Christ, when I think about the goodness of God, I must praise his name, I must lift my voice, and I must give my heart to him and my life to him out of gratitude. For he changed me and he saved me. Friends, I know who I was before I met Jesus. Do you remember who you were before you met him? The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 11, he <coughs> speaking to the, the believers in the city of Corinth, he talks to them about who they were before Christ. He says, starting in verse 9, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. If you want to write that down and read it later. But I'll read it to you. Paul says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? He writes, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality. Verse 10. He doesn't just talk about sexual sins, friends. Listen to this. Verse 10 he says, Or those who were thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people. He said, None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 11 he says this to them. And some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
friends, you see, like the believers in Corinth, we all have come out of different lifestyles, including some of the ones that Paul mentions in this text from Corinthians. But we were changed, we were cleansed. Yes, we still struggle with evil desires. Yes, we still have our challenges. Yes, we still have our weaknesses. But I think we can say that because of Jesus Christ, we're no longer bound to those desires. We don't have to give in to those desires. Why, friends? Because of Jesus Christ, we can say we have been set free. We can say we used to be in bondage. We used to be slaves to sin. But now because of Jesus we are free. We've been changed. See, my friends, this part of our testimony is so powerful and can be so encouraging to other people. Because when we share with people what our lives were like before we met Jesus, before we accepted Jesus, they can see that their lives can be changed just as our lives have been changed. It's a powerful part of our testimony, letting people know what we were like before we accepted the Lord. Pastor Jim Simbola said this. He said, people pay attention when they see that God actually changes persons and sets them free. He writes, when a new Christian stands up, and tells how God has revolutionized his or her life. No one dozes off. When someone is healed or released from a life-controlling bondage, he writes, everyone takes notice. But friends, we need to share our testimony because God can use that testimony to change people's lives. Yes, the first part of sharing our testimony is telling people what our life was like before we accepted Jesus. The second part of sharing our testimony is telling people how we accepted Jesus, how we accepted the Lord. Then verses 6 to 11, the apostle Paul tells the crowd how he met the Lord and how he accepted the Lord. Let me read those verses to you. Paul says, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. See, the Lord made it perfectly, he made it clear that Paul knew who was talking to him. He said, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 9, now those who were with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me. And came into Damascus. You see, Paul was on his way to Damascus. Why? To hunt down some Christians and to have them persecuted. But on his way, Paul had a personal confrontation with Jesus Christ. And the Lord asks Paul this question. He asks Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Now, what did the Lord mean by that? Why did he say, why are you persecuting me? The Lord kind of made it personal. You guys see that? He, he kind of made this thing personal. He said, why are you persecuting me? Well, understand the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ. Right? So when Paul was persecuting the church, he was actually persecuting the Lord. One commentator pointed this out. He said, yet in spite of that, in spite of Paul persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ himself, this commentator said, Jesus didn't come to punish Paul. He came to do what? To save Paul. Hallelujah. What a wonderful Savior we serve. See, on that day, on that day, on that road to Damascus, Paul met the Lord and Paul accepted the Lord. And then he began a life of obedience to the Lord. 
For see, the, the text says he, 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 he still couldn't see because the bright light had blinded him. But the text lets us know, the text lets us know that Paul had his companions lead him to Damascus. He still went to Damascus, right? But now it was not out of hate for the Christians. It was out of obedience to the Christ. Friends, your salvation experience and my salvation experience, it may not be as dramatic as Paul's, but it is just as significant and it is just as powerful. You know, I believe one of the challenges we have as believers as we've been saved for some time is we get comfortable, or is that the right word, or, or used to the fact that we've been saved. We, 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 we forget the power of our salvation. We, we forget the significance of, of Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying for our sins because he loves us. And we forget the, the, the change. We forget the, the transformation. Why? Because we've been saved for a while. That's why young believers are, are, are so excited, have so much passion about their faith. Oh, my friends, if if you're like me and you've been saved for some time now, let's pray that the Spirit of God would bring back that passion, bring back that excitement, bring that enthusiasm that we used to have when we first got saved. We can say glory to God for saving my life. Hallelujah. Friends, your salvation story and, and my salvation story, your salvation experience and mine is powerful. English pastor, Joseph Aline wrote, conversion is a work above man's power. It is a resurrection from the dead, a new creation, a work of absolute omnipotence. Conversion is a supernatural work. Hallelujah. You see, friends, our salvation experience, it is a supernatural work, an example of God's love. Paul said in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, Paul wrote these words, but God shows his love for us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. While we were still sinners, Christ died. In other words, Jesus Christ knew the sins we were going to commit. He knew we were going to make promises to him and break those promises. Yet he went on the cross anyway. He died anyway. He loves us so much, oh friends. He gave his life that we may have everlasting life. Oh, what a powerful aspect of our testimony to share. How we met the Lord, how we accepted the Lord, and how he saved us from sin. The great love of God is a supernatural work. And we must tell people, we must tell people how much Jesus loves us and how we came, how he came to earth to meet us and to save us. Jesus came, the Bible says, to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. See, this, friends, hear me this morning, friends. This is the message of hope that our world needs to hear in the midst of COVID-19 and the midst of this, this year, 2020, that has been, been full of so many challenges in so many different ways for so many of us. So many families are struggling. So many families are hurting. So many people are searching for truth. And we have the truth that God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. And whomever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the message of hope, my friends, that you and I must share with the world. We must share that aspect of our testimony that Jesus saved us. That he met us right where we were. That he didn't, he didn't wait for us to get our acts together. He got us together. <laughs> Hallelujah. He saw us. And he saw our needs. He said yes to us. And he called us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And made us sons and daughters of the most high God. Friends, don't take it for granted. Praise God for it. Hallelujah. And be thankful for the goodness 
of our God. Remember, friends, the day our Lord saved us and changed us. Well, the first part of our testimony is telling people what our life was like before we accepted Christ. The second part of our testimony, telling people how we accepted Christ. And now the third part of our testimony is telling people what life is like after accepting Christ. Write that down. What life is like now after accepting Christ. Well, as I said, Paul goes to Damascus as the Lord had told him to do. And in verses 12 through 16, now Paul tells them how much his life has changed after he accepted the Lord. Let me read for you verses 12 through 16. Paul says, And one named Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken by all the Jews who lived there, he came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said to me, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one whom is Jesus, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. God sends Ananias, this godly man, to heal Paul and to give him his new life assignment. Paul's life now is going to be radically changed. And God sends this man, Ananias, as, as, as his mouthpiece, as, as, as his servant to, to, to help Paul, to, to show Paul God's new plan for his life. And his new life assignment was this. Paul was to go and tell all people about Jesus Christ. Paul's life was changed from being a menace to the church to being a missionary to the church. And we know that he went on from there to be a great theologian, to be a great church planter. And, and Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. This man, this man who, who thought he was doing God's will to throw Christians in prison. You know, the Bible tells us that the first person who was martyred, the first believer, the first Christian who was martyred was a man named Stephen. And he was stoned. And the Bible tells us that this same Paul that we're talking about, this same Paul, when this man was, was being stoned, when, when Stephen was being murdered for his faith in Jesus, Paul was standing there approving it. And he went on to become this terrorist to come against the church. That's who he was. But then he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, and Jesus changed him, and now he has become this great servant of God. And God used him to do great, wonderful things for the church. My friends, listen. God may not use you and I as he used Paul. But we must remember that we are God's servants. If we give our lives to him, he'll use us to do great things. He'll change us from where we used to be to who he will have us to be. Remember who we were before we accepted the Lord? Do you remember the person that you used to be? Some of us were rude and mean. Some of us were disrespectful and, and prideful. But we all were spiritually weak and we all were in bondage to sin. But now after accepting Christ, we have been spiritually set free. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. And we have a new hope and a new life. Why? Because of Jesus. That is our testimony. We should share it, hallelujah, with the world. Letting the world know, this is what God has done for me. He's changed me. He's turned me around. And now I'm promised eternal life. I'm a son in the door of the most high God. This is our testimony. Oh, friends, God may not use us to be a missionary or to, or to build the biggest church in Philadelphia, but he will use us to touch someone's life. He saved us for a purpose, friends. We weren't saved, friends, just to go to church and hear a message and go home and come back the following week and do it all over again. No, we were saved for service. Hallelujah. 
We were saved for service, to serve God, to serve people, to tell people about Jesus Christ. About the new hope, the new life we have in the Lord. And only God can change us. Only God can change our hearts, friends. And that is what he has done for all us who, who call ourselves believers or Christians. God has changed our heart. There's, there's a story in John chapter 9 that, that is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. In this particular story, Jesus Christ heals this blind man. And he heals this blind man and the religious leaders who hated Jesus. They kept in, in, interrogating this blind man, trying to, to find out how, what did Jesus do? Uh, what does this Jesus do to, to, to heal you? Because they hated the Lord, you see. And they were looking for something to charge him with. They, they didn't believe in the Lord. They, they didn't like him at all, you see. So they kept bringing this blind man in. They even brought in the man's parents. Asking him and his parents, how did your son gain his sight? And the Bible says, finally, they brought the blind man in for the last time. And, and the man who was blind said, look, 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 look. He says, I don't know everything there is about Jesus. He says, the one thing I know is this. I was blind. Hallelujah. But now I see. Glory to God. You see, my friends, we may not be able to explain every doctrine that's in the Bible. But we can say that because of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven of our sins and promised eternal life. We've been changed because of Jesus. That's your story. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Hallelujah. Will you stick with that story? Will you share your story? Will you tell people? Will you tell them when you have that opportunity, will you tell them? what your life was like before you accepted the Lord. And, and tell them about the miraculous experience, the transformation that happened to you after you accepted the Lord. And, 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 and how, did that, how, did, how did it come about? And when you told them what life is like now, now we have hope. Now we don't live in fear. Now we're not afraid of death. Now we know that we are, we are son and daughter of the Most High God. Now we know that we're loved by our Heavenly Father. Will you tell them your story, your testimony? It will change lives. As I prepare to close, uh, please remember that when you're telling your testimony, my friends, keep it short. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Keep it short. It's not a sermon. It's not an epistle. Keep it short. You don't want to lose their attention. Keep it short and sweet when you tell them your testimony. Last, I want to say to you is this. This week, if you have that opportunity of sharing your testimony, and if you forget everything that I've said today, everything, right? Or... If, if you really can't remember all the details of how you got saved, take some encouragement from evangelist D.L. Moody. And he said this, it's not as important that we should be able to tell people where or how we became a Christian, but it is important that we should be able to tell them that we are a Christian. Can you do that? You may forget everything I said today. Maybe you, 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 you don't remember the place and time when you became a Christian. But do you know you're saved? Are you sure of your salvation? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord? If you know that, my friends, you have a testimony. Go tell people what God has done and God is doing in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son that he came, that he lived a sinless life, 
that he died for us on the cross for our sins, and that he rose on the third day. God, I pray that you would just infuse in us, Father, an excitement again for our salvation. Give us a passion again to tell people, all people, what Jesus has done for us. I pray for those who are listening to me and watching me this morning. I pray for an anointing upon their lives, oh God, that you will give them an opportunity this week, this week, that will be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And this week, with your help, Spirit of God, they will tell someone about the Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching me today and if you're saying to me, Pastor Barry, I'm not a Christian, and I don't know what will happen to me when I die. I want you to know you can be sure of your salvation if you ask Christ into your life. So if you're watching me today, and you don't know what or where you would end up when you die, and you want to have everlasting life, pray this prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Father God, I am a sinner. Forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died for me and rose on the third day. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. I pray in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, friends, the word of God says you are saved. You are born again. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. And I tell you, if you pray that prayer today, the work that God started in your life today, he will take it to completion. If you're in the uh, Delaware County, Pennsylvania area, please contact our church. We want to help you as you start this new life of being a Christian. If you're not in our area, please, I, 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 I ask you, contact a Bible teaching church. Tell them that you're a new Christian and you need to be discipled. Amen. For our evangel family, next week, next Sunday, we will be back here together in our sanctuary. So look forward to seeing you guys come in and we can worship together. Folks, stay safe. Know that I love you and know that I'm praying for you. Let me bless you. Where you are, just hold up your hands. In your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you are, hold up your hands. Unless you're driving. Don't hold, don't hold them up then. But if you can't hold your hands up, let me bless you. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, friends. Love you. Have a wonderful day and wonderful week. See you soon. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. Come on, church. I am who you say I am. You crown me with comfort. I am seen. Yeah. In the heavenly place, undefeated. With the one who has conquered it all. That's a good place to lift your voice. I tried so hard to see. It took me so long to believe that you'd choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn. You give what we don't deserve. And listen, you take the broken things and raise them to glory. Sing it out, church. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, and I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the
the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Now I can finally see you teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving see this is. This is my victory. Now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving This is my It's already won. The battle is already won. And the victory is yours. Yes, it is. And when I lift my voice and shout, everyone comes crashing down. I have the authority. Yes, I do. Jesus has given me And when I open up my mouth Miracles start breaking out I have the uh, Do you believe it? Come on. Jesus has given me
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. On the other side of this praise is nothing but victory for me. On the other side of this praise is nothing but victory for me. Sing. You are my champion. Child Yeah. Every battle you won. And I am who you say that I am. seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one yeah. yes I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all